Hi everyone, this is Deekshit. Welcome to my channel. In this particular video, we will going to discuss about daily activities of a cloud or a DevOps engineer. And this video can benefit somebody who is searching opportunities in DevOps area or who are already working in DevOps project, but they want to know more about um, uh, DevOps activities and DevOps tasks, DevOps tools. It will also help them as well. And also all the activities that I'm going to discuss, uh, which I came across in my current or a previous project. So now, uh, without wasting any time, let's get started. The first task that I want to discuss is related to FinOps. So first, let's understand what is FinOps. So FinOps, uh, in perspective to DevOps, is like whatever the cloud infrastructure that we use it for a project or for our system. So by using this FinOps concepts, we will going to reduce the cost of the total uh, cloud infrastructure that we use by making sure that we have same performance, same stability, same um, reliability and same availability. So we need to make sure all those things are same, but the cloud cost or whatever the infrastructure cost that we have, we are having should be reduced. So to reduce the cost, uh, multiple projects, multiple organizations uh, will take different, different actions. So I was also involved in few activities to reduce the cloud infrastructure cost. A few of them are listed here. So let's discuss one by one. The first one is uh, turn off lower environment tools and spin up on request spaces. So you can see on the screen, this is one of the project where I had worked on. So where uh, we used to provide build tools and SEM tools for the developer community. And to deploy, uh, this is the infrastructure that we had used. So Amazon EKS, on top of that, we used to have uh, separate node groups for each tool. And in that each node group, we used to launch EC2 instances. On top of that EC2 instances, we used to deploy Jenkins, Garrett, Grafana, Prometheus as a pods. And for each and every tool, we had different, different node groups because each tool, one tool will be memory intensive. So we might need to have a different uh, instance type. And likewise, Grafana and uh, Prometheus are not CPU intensive or memory intensive. We wanted to go with the generic instance type. So that's where we had different, different node groups for each tool. And as many organizations maintains, we also had two environments. One is integration environment and prod environment. And integration environment, so we used to do infra changes, we used to deploy it, and we used to play with any plugins uh, that we have it in Jenkins, or like any upgrade, we used to do it in the f first in the end, and then only we move it to production. And in prod, so actual builds and uh, developer code will be there in the Garrett. So it is very important system as well in that particular project. And uh, initially, when the project started, we used to keep uh, all the tools up and running in int and prod. But down the line, when everything was settled and everything was working fine, so in int, we observed that we are not doing so many activities because we never have regular activities or infra changes uh, that much because once it is stable, upgrades are like any small changes, we won't do it regularly. So we will do it maybe for three months or six months like that. So in this case, uh, it was okay uh, if you don't have tools always up and running in integration environment. So that's where we had an idea. So why not like we switch it off and on request basis, we'll bring in all the tools and whenever we want it so that we can experiment and we can deliver the things. So for that only, uh, we had written a script, shell script. So th th there we had used the concept uh, of reducing the node group size to zero. Uh, and here you can see, as I said uh, already, so all the Jenkins, all the tools, we uh, actually deployed it as a pod. So if you want to bring down Jenkins, so then by using AWS CLI commands, we used to mark the node group, this node group uh, as zero instances so that all the instances in this node group will be deleted. So if the nodes are not there, uh, which matches the label uh, to deploy this particular Jenkins, the pod will go into pending state. But the pod won't be deleted, it will be there in the pending state. And in case whenever we need it, so we used to increase the node group size to one or two instances so that the pod will be deployed and the tool will be up and running. So this is a procedure that, that we uh, kind of adopted into all the node groups so that whenever we don't need, we used to mark node groups as zero so that no instances will be there of certain labels and the tool will go into pending state. Whenever we require, we bring in the nodes and uh, tools used to be up and running through which uh, we could able to reduce a lo lot of uh, infrastructure cost because when it is not used, we don't need to keep up and running. So this is the procedure, one of the procedure that we considered. So through which we could able to reduce the project infrastructure cost. 
And then uh, moving on, uh, the next uh, few things that are actions that I've taken to reduce the cost is like, this was uh, one of the regular activity I was working on, experimenting with new generation EC2 uh, machine types. In one of the project where we were using uh, Jenkins as a build tool and uh, we had a huge uh, build system where uh, we were using, we were building a C, C++ code. When C++ code or a C code, if you want to build, we need a huge machines. If you're going with the small machines, then the build time will be increased. So that's where we had a huge machines. On top of that, we were executing the builds and it was taking an hour. And uh, so whenever uh, AWS releases a new generation machines, we used to experiment. We used to uh, create a table like this. We used to note down the cost per hour and what is the build time. So what is the uh, time production that we get? Any issues are found. So we used to do this particular regular activity so that we will gonna experiment it with new generation. And if we see any time reduction and if we, if it is benefiting us uh, uh, in a build system, so then we used to consider that and then we used to do that ch particular changes. And then uh, through which also we used to reduce the cost. For example, previously let's assume before we were using M6i12x and then uh, so the new generation, which was M7i came into picture. And you can see that there is only the slight difference. The cost is slight difference, but you can see that the build time has been reduced by 20 minutes. So wherein the faster builds, it will gonna help developers to test their changes faster. And also when there is a reduction of 20 minutes, even the cost will be reduced. So that is what uh, uh, we get it with a new generation. So we used to document like this, if it is okay for the management and seniors, so then we used to take or implement those changes. So by this also, we could able to reduce a lot of cost. Uh, you can see that 20 minutes reduction and for a day, if you get like uh, 100 builds, so then you'll be reducing 20 minutes into 100 builds. So it's a huge difference uh, if you see in the long front. So that is what on a regular basis we used to do it. And the next one is uh, using a spot instances for non-critical jobs. Spot instances are one of the great feature in AWS. So if you have, let's say daily jobs or a job where uh, even if it is kind of executed once in a week, uh, that's fine. So in that particular cases, rather than using on-demand instances, we can use a spot instances. There will be a lot of cost difference uh, so that our uh, infrastructure cost will be reduced. I'll show you. The, this is uh, AWS calculator. This is an online tool, so you can use it as well. So here you can see that I've chosen uh, one of the region and here I've just uh, checking the EC2 instance cost. You can see I've just taken M7i12x, which we were using it for a build in one of the project. So I've selected that particular machine. You can see that if you go for on-demand, hourly charges are 2.4192. But if you go for spot instances, you can see that historical average discount, it is 64%. That means whatever you're paying for R, uh, which will be 2.4, which will be reduced for one US dollar. So it's a lot of um, saving. So if we are having a non-critical jobs uh, where uh, we can use this particular spot instances, we can reduce the cost of the project. So in our case, uh, we used to do that. So we had some non-critical jobs, daily jobs, so that's where we configured those builds in such a way that it will gonna run on spot instances. So we could able to reduce the cost of the uh, infrastructure. And the next one is a very underrated task, which is uh, cleaning up of unused resources. This is also a regular activity. Every 15 days once we used to have a checkpoint where we check all the resources in EC2, S3, EBS, if we have any unused uh, uh, volumes. So we used to check uh, all our uh, infrastructure and uh, if the resource is not used then we used to take certain actions and this is uh, as i said underrated but which will definitely save a cost because when we have so many tools one or the other place uh, some or the other machine like we have we would have created it and we would have forgotten to delete it or like uh, kind of stop it so that's where we used to take this particular activity. So we used to go through each and every resource and then uh, we used to take uh, action on that if it is not used. So the next one is uh, storing a shared cache uh, in S3 instead of EFS. Uh, to store cache, uh, in the beginning we used uh, Amazon EFS and uh, the shared cache will be present in Amazon EFS. So whenever uh, the build starts, the mill machines will be created. And uh, so we will mount this EFS onto the machines. 
so that uh, the cache will be automatically used and uh, it used to execute the build faster. But the problem uh, was with VFS, whenever there were a lot of builds, then number of reads and writes will be more to VFS. So we had observed that uh, there was a performance degradation because a lot of reads and writes are happening. And also it is pretty costly as well. So if you see, I've just done a simple calculation that let's say for a month, if you use kind of 20,000 GB per month, only reading from EFS, it is charged like 600 USD. And also you can see that I'm just storing 50 GB per month, which is only write. So uh, which is around $3. If you see the total cost is 603 US dollars. Because we used to have per day at least 100 builds. If I take 100 builds, it'll, the value will be even more. So I've just considered very uh, simple numbers and you can see that uh, it is pretty costly as well. And so that's where we moved from uh, this particular EFS to S3. So what we used to do is like uh, uh, once the build is done, so whatever the cache is there, so that particular cache by using tar command and also we have something called as Pixi program in uh, tar command. So we, we use that and we used to create a tar file for the caches. Uh, let's assume we have a 50 GB of cache. We used to create the tar file for that and then we used to upload it onto S3. And whenever there is a further build, we used to download the same cache uh, from S3 and then uh, we used to execute the builds. And once we download it from the S3, we used to extract that particular tar file and then execute a build. And uh, so this is how wherein like the cast was totally reduced. You can see that uh, I've done again the simple calculations. So here we will be storing 50 GB and also number of reads, writes. You can see that I've done the calculation. You can see that almost which is uh, reduced to 100 USD. Maybe I might be wrong, bit might be wrong in the calculations. But uh, you can see that we could able to reduce a cost on our infrastructure a lot. And also the one more advantage is with uh, S3 is like once it is downloaded, the extract part will gonna happen in the machine. So that we used to have the same performance in all the builds. But uh, in the builds, so we had uh, two, three minutes uh, more, uh, which used to take because we need to download and then we need to extract that particular file. So for this, uh, a bit of time was spent. So we were okay to have two, three more minutes. So instead of paying this much to AWS. So this is one of the major activity which could able to reduce our cost a lot. And then uh, moving on, the next task is related to pipeline to deploy infrastructure. And uh, the same project, so uh, which I've explained, EKS cluster, we used to provide a build system. We had a lot of infrastructure. At the beginning of the project, we used to do everything manually. And then, so we had a problems like it was working in int and it was not working in prod. Uh, because few steps we would have missed while configuring prod. So that was the issues that we were facing. So that's where uh, we planned to move all this particular infrastructure to be created using Terraform. And uh, once we moved into Terraform, first in the beginning, so what we used to do is uh, from the developer uh, desktop itself, he or she would be uh, authenticating the AWS account. It can be in Terraform. So once uh, it is authenticated from our laptops itself, we used to deploy the changes. But again, the problem was um, there was no audit who was changed what. We don't know uh, when it was applied, what change has been applied. So that is one thing. And also whenever there is a change in tool stack, like let's say Terraform that we were using uh, some version and uh, we moved to some other version. In our local systems, we used to configure a lot. We, we need to reinstall all the tools. So that was uh, kind of a problem for us as well because to get administrative access in the company laptop, we need to raise a lot of requests and also a lot of approvals. Every now and then to do that was uh, not correct. And also main thing was we wanted to know what has been applied, when it was applied and who has applied. So that was also audit was missing. So that's the reason we created our pipelines. So the way the pipelines was working is like whenever we create a, a new merge request, we were using GitLab to store the code. And uh, so if you want to do any changes, we never uh, directly do the changes into main branch or a default branch. So we used to create a feature branch out of the main branch. We do changes and then we create a merge request. So when we create a merge request, you can see these are the stages in our pipeline it was executing. The first one was sanity. It will gonna check the sanity of uh, merge request, whether issue ID is there or not. 
and uh, information our subject line is correct or not commit message is proper or not all those things we used to check it and if it is proper then uh, so we used to execute terraform format so it is also very important when we code or when we write some particular automation it should be indented it should be readable so that's the reason we had this particular check we wanted to keep our code standard and also it should be readable so that's the reason when we execute terraform format uh, the code will be verified against uh, terraform templates so if anything wrong is there so it used to throw error and uh, we will stop the merge request here itself if everything goes well in the terraform format as well so then uh, we had a stage we executed a terraform plan and out of that terraform plan so we kind of took whatever the changes what has been updated created deleted so we uh, grabbed that plan's output and we created a good summary page so to explain what will be created what will be updated all those kind of things so once uh, that summary is provided on the logs so then user or uh, developer who want to deploy uh, so he or she can check uh, what is being deployed and what is being updated if they're okay so then they need to approve it so then the pipeline itself will gonna apply the terraform changes and it will be deployed in int environment only and once it is done and everything is working fine so once the approval is provided and merge request again uh, we will merge it back to the default branch so that's where again this particular pipeline will gonna run we used to execute sanity check and then again terraform formatting and then terraform plan so then uh, as this is uh, the master branch run or a main branch run so here uh, the approval should be provided by senior engineers or elites once they provide the approval then the terraform will uh, apply the changes in this particular stage to prod environment post merge to the major or default branch so this was the pipeline that we had implemented which is uh, which helped us for uh, faster deployments in infrastructure and as well as we had an audit like when the change has been deployed and if you want to roll back also it was very very easy for us so this was the one activity that i had worked on and uh, moving on the next activity that i want to discuss is a in devops and now a is everywhere and uh, even we wanted to use a in our projects as well to make our work or like our make to make our code a little bit better so uh, the first task uh, that I'd worked on was uh, AA bot for code review. We were storing our code in uh, GitLab. So that's where whenever the merge request uh, will be raised. So we had included a bot where it will going to check our changes. Um, and then it will going to provide all the recommendations uh, that we can take. So it was kind of qu quite easy as well. So what we did uh, here is like whenever there was a merge request. So then we take the changed files. And then by using Jim AI APIs, so we used to send this particular changes and as well as with a bit of a prompt saying that, uh, so please verify this particular changes uh, with respect to security, readability, and also best practices. Then it used to give this particular suggestions. This is a screenshot that I've taken from the internet, but this is how it used to provide the feedback for us. And then by using these particular comments, we used to adopt those changes. It really helped us to make our code a little secure and as well as to write it with the best practices. So that's where A helped us. And then uh, next task is also related to A itself. So one of the team where I was working on completely pipelines and there we used to get a regular questions. So that's where we implemented a chat bot. So where it answers the basics are repeated questions like where is my build? What is a command or how do I trigger my build? For all these basic information, we kind of could able to provide it through this chat bot. And that's where we could able to reduce one SRE engineer as well because regular questions will go onto the chat bot. We don't need a dedicated person to answer these particular questions, uh, which improved our productivity as well because we don't need to kind of continuously answer repeated questions. So these are the activities that I wanted to discuss in this particular video. Uh, if you have liked the video, please do like, share and subscribe. Thank you. Have a great day.